Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone to our Wednesday night Bible study here at Beverly Hills Baptist. If you're our guest, we thank you for tuning in on this uh, drizzly cold Wednesday afternoon, but we're excited that you were here with us. Tonight we pick up in John's Gospel, chapter 2, and we're going to take a look at the wedding of Cana and Jesus' first miracle of turning water into wine. Let's pick up in John chapter 2, verse 1. It says, On the third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. So as we pick up in this story, if you know, Jesus has just called his 12 disciples. He has gathered them with him, and he has now been invited to a wedding. Uh, from what we can understand in the context of this story, it must have been someone that was a family of Jesus or someone that he was a relative of. Hence the reason why his mother was there and Jesus was invited, and so was Jesus' friends, which were the disciples. Now, this comes on the third day, as the third day after Jesus had met John and had met the other disciples. And this wedding takes place, and Jesus was invited. Now, the story starts out that when the wine ran out, verse 3, when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. So as the story picks up, we see that there is a wedding and that uh, the wine has now ran out as the story picks up, uh, as it gets into it. And Jesus says to his mother, oh, What does this have to do with me? Now let me give you a little context on what's going on. As they're at this wedding feast, there would naturally be wine that would be served. Now the wine has ran out. Now, the bridegroom or the groom would be responsible for making sure that everything was prepared for the wedding. Running out of wine would have been a big embarrassment and humiliation to the groom. Uh, humiliated to the point that uh, he would be uh, kind of disowned and maybe even would have faced some sort of financial trouble if he did not or could not find more wine to be able to give to the people at the party. When the wine ran out, Jesus' mother comes very concerned with this. Uh, this looks bad on someone that may have been in her family, and she does not want this person to be humiliated. And so she tells Jesus uh, that they have no more wine. And Jesus says to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? Now, as we read this in English, it seems as if though Jesus was being disrespectful or rude by saying, Woman, what does this have to do with me? But you must understand in Hebrew culture, uh, the way that he phrased the word woman is an expression of polite distance. Jesus' tone was not rude, but it was abrupt. What Jesus, in fact, is doing is he is setting himself apart from his mother and from this question, saying, what does this have to do with me? Uh, Jesus is there as a guest. He is not to be made uh, the central person that would still be the focus of the bride and the groom. And yet Jesus is there solely to participate because of uh, probably being a family member. And he tells her that, uh, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Uh, in John's gospel, the word hour or Jesus's hour is the time of his crucifixion, uh, of his death, and then his exaltation or his resurrection. So what Jesus is explaining to her is that he does not want to be made the center of attention. He does not want uh, any attention to be drawn to him. What does this have to do with me? My time is not yet here. Uh, my time is not to be revealed to those around me. This, however, still leads his mother to say to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Uh, Jesus is being polite and saying that he does not want to draw attention to himself. But nonetheless, as his mother insists, Jesus will help them out in some form or fashion. Verse 6 tells us that there were six stone jars of water uh, there for the Jewish rites of purification. Stone jars would have been uh, most likely used at this time period because stone jars or uh, stone bowls would be uh, less likely to cause infection or for the water to go bad. It would have been uh, the best way for them to keep them clean and also would have been able for them to use them to wash as such as of the Jewish rites of purification. Now, each stone jar uh, was holding 20 or 30 gallons of water. Now, if you think about how large these stone jars have to be and how much they have to weigh, 
uh, just a five gallon bucket uh, is fairly large, but I couldn't imagine uh, it being a, a large stone jar, almost like a large barrel, and each one holding 20 or 30 gallons. Now Jesus says to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some of it and take it to the master of the feast. This would be the one who would be in charge. Uh, we would know this as a, a, an event coordinator or a wedding planner. Take it to the master of the feast. So they took it, and when the master of the feast tasted the water, which had now become wine, he did not know where it came from. And now, of course, uh, probably the uh, wedding master uh, is, uh, or the master of the feast is probably trying to figure out where can I get more wine? We've ran out, and we don't want to make this a big scene, but we need to get more. And all of a sudden, these servants come carrying these uh, buckets or these uh, stone jars of water, and it brings it to them, and he tastes it, and he says, well, where does this come from? Now, in parentheses, it says, though the servants who had drawn the water knew exactly where it had come from. They knew this miracle that Jesus had performed. Uh, and they did not say anything uh, publicly. They kept it to themselves, but they knew. Now, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. He calls him, and he says to him, everyone who serves good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, uh, then... Uh, the poor wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. Now, I'll get into more of the expression on this in a minute, but I want to talk to you just a little bit about wine. Uh, the wine that was served was subject to fermentation. Uh, in the ancient world, however, to quench thirst without inducing drunkenness, wine was diluted with water between one-third and one-tenth of its strength. Now, due to the climate and to the circumstances, even new wine ferments quickly and had an inebriating effect if it had not been mixed quickly. Because of the lack of water purification process, wine mixed with water was also safer to drink than water alone. While in the Bible condemns drunkenness, it does not necessarily condemn the consumption of wine. And so we see here that this would have been fermented wine. It would have been able to cause drunkenness if it was in its pure state. Uh, but in order to dilute that, to keep from someone becoming intoxicated, the wine was diluted with water. Uh, and also, this would also purify water. Uh, water back then, the only way uh, that we know of to uh, purify water through a process is through heating it. Now, you could heat it in stone jars, but uh, jars of clay would more likely have burst. And uh, putting it into wine skins or to skins would have caused them to rupture as the water heated up. But to mix a little bit of wine with water would dilute the wine to keep it from being too inebriating in its drinking process and then causing the water to be more purified so that it could be consumed and drunk without making the person sick. Here, uh, the feast master says, Every word serves the good wine first, and then when people have drunk freely, uh, then the poor wine. Uh, the reason that he states this is because uh, when you drink the good wine and you become a little inebriated, as they may have been, or they uh, become a little uh, more involved in the party, uh, once the good wine was served, then they would serve uh, the uh, inferior wine because as the party carried on and as people become a little inebriated, uh, they would not be able to tell the difference between good wine and old wine or good wine and bad wine. He says, but you have kept the good wine until now. Uh, the good wine that probably had a better flavor, uh, probably was uh, maybe uh, not as strong. Uh, and uh, this would have been something that would have been done unusual for the circumstances. Why put out the good wine last when people have drunk of the good wine before? That goes to show you that the miracle that Jesus done was not a half-done miracle. Uh, yes, Jesus did turn water into wine. Uh, yes, this would have been fermented wine, and yes, probably still would have had water added to it. Uh, but this shows that Jesus, who performs this miracle, done so uh, fully, uh, that it was a full-blown, well-done miracle. It was not something that was a fate, not something that was attempted. It wasn't taking wine that he had found somewhere else and just mixing a lot of water to it uh, to make it go further. This was, in fact, a case of a miracle where Jesus turned water into wine. Now, as we pick up in verse 11, it gives us a little more insight into this. Jesus, uh, this was the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Now, here's the reason why Jesus turned the water into wine. 
Yes, there was a party going on. Yes, there was a feast. Yes, there was a wedding. And yes, they ran out of wine. And yes, this could have been embarrassing. But here's the reason why Jesus did this. Even though he did it quietly, he did it for this reason. The first of all, this was his first sign. This is the first miracle that Jesus performed in his earthly ministry. And Jesus did this in Cana of Galilee. But here's why. It manifested his glory. This miracle showed the glory of Jesus as the sovereign creator and ruler of the material universe. Jesus does this to show that he is absolutely sovereign and in authoritative control of everything that was going to take place and that will take place. God is completely in control. We call this the sovereignty of God. God is in complete control of everything that takes place from the beginning of the time until the end, uh, from when we are first born until we reach uh, eternity heaven with Jesus, uh, from the Old Testament to the New Testament and everything in between, God is completely in control. Jesus is completely in control, and it shows that he has uh, power over the material universe. Later on in the miracles that we see, uh, we'll begin to see Jesus healing the blind, healing the lame, uh, healing the sick. But it's interesting that none of those were his first miracle, but that his first miracle to show his power over the created universe was to turn water into wine. It says that after this, his disciples believed in him. They knew that Jesus was the one who was to become the Messiah, who was the Messiah born. Uh, Jesus was the one who was prophesied from the Old, uh, from the Old Testament, prophesied to be the Messiah. John the Baptist proclaimed that Jesus was the Messiah, the one who would take away the sins of mankind. Now, as the disciples gather with him, they notice that something is different with Jesus. Uh, they notice that there's something different with this man. But then here, Jesus, in this first miracle, something so simple as turning water into wine, shows the power and the authority and the divine nature of this Jesus. And it goes to their mind to say that this is the Messiah. This is the one who will take away the sins of mankind. After this, they went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brother and his disciples. And it says they stayed there for a few days. After the wedding, they... Uh, continue on and uh, the story ends there with Jesus as he goes to Capernaum with his family and his friends uh, and he stays there for a few days. A very interesting little story as we have read about how Jesus turned the water into wine and it goes again to show us that this miracle was done to show Jesus's glory, uh, to reveal to his disciples, to his uh, those who will become his inner circle, to show them that he is the one who was proclaimed to be the Son of God. Let us go to our Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you. And as we read through the scriptures and as we see this little story, we thank you and we praise you uh, that we see this sovereign, powerful control of who Jesus is. As John mentioned in the beginning of his gospel, he talks about Jesus being uh, the creator of all. And it was through the Father, the Son, and the power of the Holy Spirit that everything was spoken into existence. And so, Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you that we see this divine nature of Jesus and we see that he is the Messiah who come and who took away the sins of the world. Father, we thank you and we praise you that our sins have been forgiven and that you are absolute control. And we put our faith and our trust in you. And Heavenly Father, until we see you face to face, we praise your holy name. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for tuning in with me tonight. If you do not have a church home, we would love to have you here at Beverly Hills Baptist. Until we meet again and until we see the Lord face to face, I pray that he will watch over you, protect you, and keep you safe. God bless.